You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Dr. Mayor Margolit from Israel. Dr. Margolit, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Dr. Margolit, is there a way that you prefer to be referred to? Is Dr. Margolit fine, or would you like mayor, or however you'd like me to... Mayor, it's okay. Mayor? Okay, great. It's okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Now, you've been in the news relatively recently about defending Palestinian homes in Israel. I want to get into that in great detail in a moment. Before we do, for the benefit of the listeners, can you give them a little bit of background about who you are, where you were born, and what you've done growing up in your life, and so on and so forth? Well, I am not so important, but to say several things, I was born in Argentina, and I am living in Israel since 72. I was grow up in a very Zionist family in Argentina. For me, it was always clear that when I will finish my studies, and I will make Aliyah, I will immigrate to Israel, the only place, according to my father, where Jews can live uh, safety. And yes, in 72, I make Aliyah, immigrate, and automatically I go to a settlement, and after three months, I joined the Israeli army, and I was uh, one of the founders of a settlement in the Gaza Strip, a famous settler named Netzarim. I was one of the founders of this settlement in 73. In 73, I participated in the Yom Kippur War, I was wounded there, and since then I start to switch my mind, and in a very slowly process, I move from the right wing to the left in Israel, to the peace movement. You came in 72, and of course the Yom Kippur War was a short time. Was it less than a year after you got there? I arrived to Israel in February 72, and in October 73, the war started. And how soon after the war started were you injured? Uh, One week after. What were the extent of the injuries? Uh, it was during bomb from in Sinai when we was fighting against the, the Egyptian army, and it was not very serious, but serious enough to be around uh, two months in hospital. Well, that's pretty serious. Too much in the hospital. How are you feeling now from that injury? No, it's a long time. I feel good, but my feelings are very bad relating what is going on today, not what happens in seventy. You said the process going from right wing to left wing took a long time. How long did it actually take? Take around one year, one year, uh, because my social frame was in the right wing. It's not just a matter of ideas. My group of reference, all of it was a uh, right wing. So to change my ideology means to change also my pertinence, my group where I was there. That's why it uh, was so complicated to do it. Okay. Now you said that you came over in 72. How old were you? 18 years old. And your dad had said that Israel is the only place that it's safe for Jews. I imagine that you believed that then when your dad told you that. Do you believe that now? No, it's clear that the place where the Jews are more dangerous is in Israel. It's, it's uh, ironical, but the Zionist movement wants to find a place where the Jewish people can live uh, safely. And we are the only place, or one of the only places in the world where the Jews are really dangerous, but not because the anti-Semitic attacks, but because the Israeli policies that we make our lives so dangerous here. When did you realize this? It started um, after the Yom Kippur War, I can say. But I like to say that usually when people ask me the same question, that the Yom Kippur War was a catalyzator, catalyzator of this process, that sooner or later I would came to the same conclusion also without a war. But I realized it when I was in the hospital and I find so many people around me how you say, uh, wounded? Yes. Yes, when I find so many people wounded around me, and especially when I find so many mothers and sisters and daughters that they lose their relatives, then I started to realize that something is wrong with the idea of the big Israel. Something is wrong with the idea of the occupied territories. Then I started to realize that the price that we pay for the big Israel, for the territories, is too expensive. You went over Israel when you were 18, but obviously you're still there. Why are you there if you think it's a dangerous place for Jews because of Israeli policies? Why don't you just leave? 
from one side, you can say the masochism. Yeah. Many psychologists will say that it is a kind of masochism. But no, I feel that this is my place. I feel that this is my country, even if it is a dangerous place, even if the government is not my government and I am not there, this uh, policy. This is still my country, the place where my kids grow up, and I have to make some effort to save this country from their self. When did you then move from that point? Now, this is back in 74 when you changed your mental framework about Israel. When did you move from understanding what you understand now to being an activist? Very close. In 75, I went to the offices of Peace Now. It was the only peace movement during these years. And I asked if it's something that I can do for them. And then slowly I started to be an activist in 75, 76. During the 80s, I became a member of the Merit Party when I realized that it's not enough to be an activist. You also have to be part of a political party because this conflict is a political one. And in order to change things, from within, you have to be in the political arena. So since then, in slowly the way, I became an activist in movement and in a political party too. And were you married at that time? Yes, yes. Did you have any children? Three children, yes. At that time that you became an activist? Exactly, yes. When I have them, it was the motivation becomes more strong. At the time, had you completed your college studies or were you still in school? No, my studies, my academic studies, I make very slowly. It takes a long time because most of my energies was in working and survive and in activity. So the academic studies become a secondary thing. You got your PhD? Yes, I have a PhD in Israeli history under the British mandate. Oh, very interesting. Let's get into more of the modern day. You've been working, I guess, for over two decades with an organization called the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Exactly, yes. Okay. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about what that organization is and your involvement in it? Yes, this is an organization that started up in 1907 when we commemorate uh, 30 years since the occupation, since the 67 war. And a group of veteran uh, activists, we make a kind of evaluation about our new activism and we come to the conclusion that one of the problems that we have is that we always jump from topic to topic, from issue to issue, and we cannot be professionals in one specific issue. Then we decided that it will be more effective if we can focus ourselves in one issue, the issue of house demolitions, and from them continue our fighting against the occupation. So since 97 we work on this issue and it's important to remark it. We are talking about houses that the government demolished in Israel in both sides of the Green Line. Even Palestinians, what we call the 48 Palestinians, Israeli Palestinians, they suffer from demolitions because this people, they build without license because the government refused to give them licenses for building. In Jerusalem, I can say, for example, that the municipality refused to give Palestinian licenses because they're afraid that one day the Palestinians will become majority in the city. And a way to stop this process is to refuse to give them licenses under the assumption that then the Palestinians will leave the city, they will move to the Palestinian Authority, other places where it's easier to get licenses. But Palestinians, they never will leave the city because the municipality refused to give them licenses. What they uh, used to do is what I myself could do in this situation is to build without license. If the government will give license, it's okay, thank you. If not, they will build without license. And then the municipality come and they put a demolition order in the wall of the house and since then, 24 hours or 24 years after then, the bulldozers can come to demolish the house without any previous announcement. This is what we in ICAT, Israel Committee Against South Demolitions, we are fighting against this kind of demolitions. Do you think that, and you brought this up just a bit ago, do you think that this whole issue is primarily one of demographics, one of the Palestinians having a high birth rate, or at least a higher birth rate than the Israelis? The conflict is multifacetic. Can you see in English multifacetic? 
I guess it's multifaceted. Of course, there is a religious component and a cultural component, a political and ethnical, but also the demographic element, especially in this city, is very dominant. It's very dominant. Palestinians today, they are 38% of the population in Jerusalem. And according to different demographers, in 2020, maybe 2025, the Palestinians will become majority. And 2025 is not the future. 2025 is tomorrow. And as you can guess, imagine the idea that 2025, the Palestinians will become majority and then they will be able to vote for a Palestinian mayor to the city. This idea makes them crazy. So they are doing everything they can in order to postpone this process. And uh, one of the tools is to refuse to give them uh, licenses. But this is something that makes the government crazy. You can imagine the mayor of the capital of Israel, the mayor of the most emblematic city for the Jewish people in the world will be a Palestinian. This is something that they really, really afraid of. Right, kind of like the United States having a black president. <laughs> For example, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, that hasn't happened yet because he's half white, but okay. you know, it might happen in the future. You've actually helped to rebuild a number of homes, right? Yes, exactly. First of all, we try to stop the demolitions. We give the Palestinians with demolition orders illegal assistance. Our activists are trying to try to stop bulldozers on the ground. And when after the house has been demolished, yes, we rebuild houses again without a license, of course. The same reasons Palestinians cannot get licenses. So we rebuild houses without license. Thanks to money that comes from hundreds of small communities around the world, churches, private people, I am very proud to say that we have been, during the last 10 years, we rebuilt around 1,000 houses for Palestinians in the West Bank and in Israel too. Wow. Especially Bedouins in the Negev. 1,000? Around, yes. Wow. You must be a really loved character there in Israel, at least by the folks who want to get the Palestinians out. How has that affected you and your family's life there? Well, I prefer not to enter in such a private question. Let me just say that, yes, it's not easy to be a leftist or a pacifist in this country. It's not easy to be a leftist in Jerusalem, especially maybe even in Tel Aviv or Haifa, it's easier. But Jerusalem is a very right-wing city, a fundamentalist, and here it's not easy to be a pacifist. Yes, it's and, true. Right. Any death threats against you? More than once, people, they sent me letters or mails or they phoned to me saying that next opportunity they will kill me. This is something that I don't take very personally. My wife, yes, she is afraid, but I don't take it seriously. Okay, but it actually does happen, though. People get so inflamed that they want to kill you, or at least they say they want to kill you. Well, in this country, they kill the prime minister, so theoretically, they, something that this can happen, yes. Well, I certainly hope it doesn't. I hope they stop. But you've been doing this, obviously, for several decades, and nothing's happened, so it doesn't seem like anything's going to happen, and that's great news, because you sound like a great man. Are you also a representative on the Jerusalem City Council? Yes, exactly. I am an elected member of the Municipal Council by the marriage party, by the left party. And this is a popularly elected position? You were voted in by the residents? Yes, exactly, yes. And we are three members of my party in a Municipal Council of 31 members. And how long have you been on the City Council of Jerusalem? Well, this is my second term. I was during between 98 to 2002 when Ehud Ulmert was the mayor of Jerusalem. After then, he became prime minister, as you remember. And now I am again since 2008, so four years. So elections are coming up then? Yes, next year. So you're not that hated that you're not going to be elected into office. So obviously people don't entirely despise you, right? No, it's very curious that in the city of Jerusalem, there are more people voting for my party to the municipality than for my party to the Knesset. There are at least 10% of the population here in the city they vote for us. And it's not exactly because they share my political views, it's because we are the secular party in a city that becomes more and more religious. The secular part of the population, they want us to try to stop this process. So it's not something relating to the Palestinians, it's more relating to the problems with the Orthodox population in the city. And the population 
population of Jerusalem, I guess, is about a million in Jerusalem in the surrounding areas, right? Almost a million, yes. Uh, it's pretty big. Oh, I didn't yes. realize. Okay, and it's a modern city then, right? It's a modern city, but to be honest, you have to talk about three different cities in this city. West Jerusalem is different from East Jerusalem, where the Palestinians are living. And even inside the west part of the city, it's not the same. The secular neighborhoods are not similar to the religious, to the Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in West Jerusalem. So one of the challenges in this city is how to deal with populations so different, especially relating to East Jerusalem, where the people, they live in the 19th century or something like this. I mean, the municipal services are more close to the first world than to a modern city. Wow. And this is something systematic and comes from uh, above. If you will give a look to the municipal budget, the percent of money that the municipality invests in East Jerusalem is no more than 11%, when Palestinians, they are 38% of the population. So I say it again, 38% of the population, they get just 11% of the budget. That's one of the reasons why the infrastructures look as a third world and not as a modern city. And this is also first of all a tool of control and together with the demolitions and other elements in education welfare etc the motivation is to convince Palestinians to leave the city voluntarily because they know they cannot put them on trucks and expel them by force so the idea is let make life so hard that they will prefer to leave the city voluntarily but that's not happening, right? As you said. Been no, there. no. Palestinians, they will never leave their land because the government makes life harder. It's clear that the government doesn't know the Palestinian culture, the Palestinian mentality, the Palestinian tradition. No, nothing will make them leave the land. The Israeli Ministry of the Interior, they have begun legal proceedings against you. Is that yes, correct? Yes, exactly. Yes, it's right. What's that all about? It was a surprise for me that several months ago they called me for an interrogation and they accused me to build houses in East Jerusalem without license. And it was a surprise because I am doing the same work for more than 10 years. Why now? I asked them. And the answer is that, yes, they are trying to intimidate me and to intimidate the, this movement in Israel. It was very curious. The guy that interrogates me, he feels very embarrassed and he apologized. It's not something that comes from him. So I asked him from where it comes, and he said it comes from above. I asked him it comes from the general director of the ministry. The answer was more than this. And I asked him it comes from the minister himself. The answer was you say it. So we are in a Makartist period. This is something that you know from your history very well. We are in a Makartist period when the government is trying to intimidate the peace movement and almost all of us, sooner or later, will have this kind of experiences. But it's okay. During the next month, they will send me to the court and I hope to make this issue a political issue. It's time that the court also will say something about the situation. When did they first approach you? Three months ago, I said. There are a lot of young students here saying, Mayor, we support you, but please don't ask us to participate in any demonstration, to sign an open letter, to put a sticker in the car, because my boss will make me problems, because my neighborhood can make me problems, etc., etc. They succeed to intimidate young people here, yes. It's very similar to the United States. During McCarthy period, you mean? No, even now. Even now? Yep. So we are in a good neighborhood. Many friends of mine, they ask me, Mayor, what are you doing in the municipality? You are working for the establishment that they discriminate Palestinians. It is a dilemma for me, and every morning I ask myself what I am doing here in the municipality. I believe that it's important to fight against the system from outside and also from within. And what I am trying to do here is to minimize damages, as many Palestinian friends, they ask me to do. I believe that this is a political conflict. I think that we have to be also part part of the political system, even if we know that we become complicit of what the municipality is doing in East Jerusalem. But they believe that uh, it's important to do it from outside, but also from within. Is there any way that listeners can help you out? Is there a website they can go to? Is there an organization they can contact? Let's say they want to do help fund this mission. I invite everybody to enter to our website in icad.org and it is something that they can do to support us. We will be very happy and there is also a representation of ICAD in the USA. So you can find ICAD USA also and contact the office there.
Mayor, it looks like an article where we're talking about you. It says that one Jewish Israeli, Mayor Margalit, a member of the Jerusalem City Council, has been in the forefront of opposition to the destruction of Palestinian homes, which we already know about. By his own word, he was left speechless by the gravity of his countrymen's latest actions. In a recent article on the German Catholic website, Cruz.net, he makes clear that this is not an isolated incident by a fringe group, but that such extremists now make up the majority of Israelis. Are you familiar with that article? Yes, okay. yes I didn't know that has been published in English. I think it may have been translated. Yeah. Okay. And it says that Margulis tells how his Franciscan friends are regularly derided and abused in public, even having stones and eggs thrown at them and fulfilling the dictum of the Talmud being spat upon by, and this is in quotes, religious Jews. Margulis lays the blame for the increase of anti-Christian barbarity squarely at the feet of the Israeli government and the rabbis, who he says have the power to stop the harm but refuse to do so. Is this all accurate? Yes, Mike? exactly, exactly. It's not easy for me to say it, but uh, yes, this is what is going on, and I believe that we have to say it clearly, because this is a strategy also to stop these barbarities, yes. In other words, the Christian priests get spit on? Yes. The religious Jewish residents in the whole city, yes, the spirit Christians, not just the Franciscans. Also, you can hear it from the Greek Orthodox, from the Armenians, and from others, yes. Okay. It's a shame, but it's true. Have you seen this, personally? No, if I was there, I would give them, uh, how do you say in English? You'd give them a piece of your mind. Yes, I would give them by myself, yes. But I know personally this priest that they told me this history, so I heard this from them. Do they say where they actually spit on them? Do they spit like at their feet? I don't know exactly the details, okay. but this has become a very common attitude in their religious group, yes. Okay, and do you know if the Christians or your friends actually spit back at these religious Jews? No, no. They say that Christianity said that you don't have to react in this way. In many cases, it seems crazy, but they say thank you and shalom, and they continue this way. A Greek priest, he reacts. The police arrest the Jewish and the Greek priest, but when they realize what happens, they release him and they take the Jewish to the court, yes. The Christians refer to that as turning the other cheek. Mm -hmm, yes. And it says here, finally, that as a consequence, Margalit, who is himself being persecuted in Israeli court for his defense of Palestinians, and of course we've already spoke about that, foresees an increase in retaliatory behavior against Jews in other countries due to Israeli belligerence. He states that according to Hebrew tradition, the Jewish temple was destroyed in part due to Jewish lack of respect for one's neighbor. He predicts the collapse of the state of Israel, quote, not on account of external enemies, but because of the Israeli lack of human moral and ethical values. Yes, that's what I say before, that I'm trying to save the country from herself, yes. It's been a great pleasure to speak with you, sir, and thank you for doing what you're doing and for caring about people the way you do. And your wife is a lucky person, and your children are very lucky. And anyone that has the great fortune to come into contact with you, especially on a regular basis, should consider themselves very fortunate. Thank you very much, David. It was a pleasure, and please let's keep in touch.